some passengers were transferred from the laid-up INM ships. Eva Hart and her family were originally booked on the Philadelphia. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And this cold strike came and she didn't sail. And we were then offered a berth in the Titanic, which absolutely delighted my father. I thought it was wonderful. The whole world was talking about that ship. And my mother had this dreadful premonition. She'd never had one before and she never had one after. But she said, no, we, we, we can't do this. It's quite wrong. Something dreadful will happen. And I, I tell you what the sort of woman she was. She'd got both feet on the ground. And for her to behave like that was absolutely unbelievable to everyone. But she just had that premonition. I was seven. I'd read there was a big ship. It didn't really convey as much to us as it did to my parents, obviously. I mean, I, I'd never been in a ship at all before, so it didn't convey very much to me. I do know everyone was talking about it. It was inevitable that the Titanic would sink. Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, confirmed this to Captain Smith. But still, the passengers were unaware of their imminent peril. I was in bed, of course. And she just came and joined in whatever was happening during the evening, and that sort of thing. And my father got very cross because he had every reason to dislike gambling. His father had been a compulsive gambler and had died utterly penniless from being quite a wealthy man. And so everybody was gambling on this Sunday night. They were making books, I think the term is, and having sweepstakes as to what time she would get in so many minutes past so and so. My father would have nothing to do with it. And so he went to bed quite early, for him anyway. And my mother sat down to sew and read and she looked up at him, he was reading, he said he'd got a very interesting book. But quite quickly, he went to sleep and she got up and took the book from him and set her down again. And she said at 10 minutes to 12, she felt a slight bump. And she said it was just like a train pulling into a station. It just jerked. It was very slight, but she said she knew that it was this dreadful something and she wakened my father. She wakened me, and my father said no, he wasn't going up on deck again after the night before. But she literally pulled him out of bed and made him go up. And she then said she was going to dress me, and I, being sleepy and very naughty, said I wasn't going to be dressed. Nothing to be dressed for, I'm going back to bed. My father came back very quickly, because he could get up to the boat deck in the lift very quickly from where our cabin was. And, um, he came back and he picked me up and wrapped this blanket tightly around me as if I were a baby. And my mother said nothing to him and I used to say to her sometimes, years afterwards, I can't understand why you didn't say to him what was it, which she certainly did not say. And she said, I didn't have to say what was it, I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was this dreadful something that I had to live with for months and there was nothing more I could say. So he put his very thick coat on her and put another one on himself. And without any words at all, we went out of the cabin and into the lift and up onto the boat deck. Now, if we hadn't done that at that time, I very much doubt I'd be talking to you today because, as you know, there were less than, there was accommodation for less than 800 people in the lifeboats and she was carrying 2,200. So it was a question as who was there in time to get into one of the all too few lifeboats. Well, they weren't launched very quickly because at first no one thought anything was going to happen. But my father went away and spoke to an officer and he said, um, they are going to launch lifeboats, but you'll all be back on board for breakfast. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean. We could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. There wasn't any panic at the time I got in a lifeboat because there weren't enough people up there. And were there enough people there to just get into the lifeboats? But after that, when the others started coming up from their cabins and there were no boats, gosh, there was panic. We could hear it. Definitely. As each lifeboat reached the water, it moved away from the ship for fear of the suction should she sink. Some rode towards the lights of a ship which could be seen just a few miles away. 
this ship was never identified and never reached. And of course, there are still um, threats of legal things even these days about whether the ship that was so close to us was the Californian or not. I mean, I saw that ship. It's terribly close. And the other thing I'm saying is that I didn't see a ship 19 miles away. I saw a ship that was so close. And they said at the time it was less than nine miles away. Now they're trying to say it was 19. Um, I saw it, you know, it wasn't just lights on the horizon. You could see it was a ship. And I saw our rockets being fired, which that ship must have seen. Well, this inquiry says that they did see it, but they didn't think it was a portent of danger. But I would have thought in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, <laughs> that rockets must mean trouble. The band now played a solemn air. Some say autumn. But popular belief says it was nearer my God to thee. Well, there's no question about the fact that they played, and there's no question about the fact that after we were down on the water and they were playing, they played one um, version of the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, of which there were three. I've had this out so many times. And the one they played was the one that was played in church some months after when I was there with my grandmother, and I was so frightened I came out of church, I ran out, I knew the tune so well. But they won't have it, the Americans won't have it. People say, no, no, it's not it. The visible part of the ship apparently settled back slightly before it, too, disappeared beneath the sea. It was this settling that indicated the ship had broken in two. And we rowed away uh, from the ship as fast as we could, because one has to do that, because I believe the suction when a vessel goes down is absolutely enormous. And we rowed away, and I didn't close my eyes at all. I saw that ship sink. And I saw that ship break in half. And for so many years, people have argued with me about that. But now at last, it has been proven beyond all doubt that she did break in half. I know she did, I saw her. And the forepart went down nose first, and the other, the stern of that ship stood up in the water for quite a long time, or it seemed a long time to me, and then keeled over. And we heard the dreadful sound of people drowning, which was, oh, unbelievable. And then, because our lifeboat was so full, so over full, the officers called all the boats together and transhipped some of us, one in that boat and two in that and three in that, and I got separated from my mother. And uh, that was the most terrifying thing to happen to a child. But the most dreadful sound of all is the sound of people drowning. The screams, absolutely ghastly. My mother used to say sometimes, she couldn't get me to talk about it for years, but if ever I did, anyone did talk to me, I said that, she used to say yes. But do you remember the silence that followed it? And that's quite right, it's as the whole world stood still that night. Once the lights had gone, the ship had gone, the sound had gone, oh, it was dreadful, dreadful. Now there was nothing to do but wait for rescue. Among those standing on the upturned boat was Harold Bride, the wireless operator, who confirmed to his companions that the Carpathia was on her way. At 3.30 a.m., she was sighted on the horizon, firing rockets. And at 4.30, she was on the sea. The Carpathia arrived with the dawn. And by 8.30, had taken on board 705 survivors and 14 lifeboats, the rest being set adrift. And uh, we were picked up, as you know, in the morning by this little ship, the Carpathia. And the rescue uh, of people from lifeboats in mid-ocean is quite a terrifying thing. These little boats, shall we say, draw up alongside, for want of a better expression, to what looks like an enormous vessel. She was quite a small vessel, the Carpathia, but she looked big from there. And then how do you get on board? You don't have a gangplank like you do when you're ashore. And so they opened a, a, a sort of, I don't know whether the word is right, a hatch in the side of the ship where the luggage used to be laid. And um, they threw down rope ladders and people like my mother and other grown-ups had to climb up in mid-ocean up a swaying rope ladder, rope ladder, which she said was the most terrifying thing. A sailor behind sort of holding on. 
And then uh, what can the children do? We couldn't climb up a rope ladder. So they got these big luggage nets and the mesh is very wide apart. It's quite a big mesh. Children would have slipped through it, small children. Anyway, our legs and feet would have gone through. So each child was put in a sack. And I remember being petrified when I was put in that sack and it was tied around and the sack full of these children were put into these huge nets and quite safely, of course, hauled aboard. But that really was quite terrifying. And then having got on board, of course, I couldn't find my mother. And I didn't find her for hours, but eventually I found her. And I'm quite sure one of the most pathetic things must have been the whole of the next day how these poor women, such as my mother, my mother roamed about the ship looking to see if they could see the husband they left behind. But no one found anyone. A silver memorial plaque has been left on the wreck as a mark of respect and to honour her as an official grave to the hundreds who perished with her and as a tribute to a disaster which should never have happened. I entirely agree with my dear Dr. Bellard's words. He said the whole thing was a tribute to man's arrogance and I agree with that. That man can be so arrogant as to build something and claim that it is undestroyable, if you like. It's, it's the most arrogant thing to say. True, if the Titanic had struck rocks or a tempest and storm and sunk, that would be one thing. But this was a ship that needn't have had any loss of lives. That, I think, is the most dreadful part of it. And as I say, all these years later, this interest is profound. And it's because there was no need for anyone to die. No one should have died. Had she had enough lifeboats for two and a half hours and a very smooth sea, nobody would have died. And one life is worth more than the whole ship, surely. That is what I saw, that is what I remember. And there are hardly any of us now to share this memory, of course. I'm the only living survivor now that can remember it and um, get about, so to speak. But I don't think it's anyone that can really tell the whole story of it, except myself.